Let's worship God with this song from Tolu Odukoye Ijogu, God Alone. Before we start, I just love the song. Let's just worship God together with the song. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for tonight. We will turn the glory to you. Our God is God alone. This is a song done by Tolu Odukoye Ijogu, God Alone. Yes, Lord. Without a reason, I'll still praise you, Lord. How Lord. Thank you, Jesus. How still praise you, Lord. You are God. Reigning majesty. Lord, you reign. King of authority. That's who you are, Lord Jesus. You are God. You are God, Lord. We worship you, King of Kings. Thank you, Lord. Father, we worship you. Yes. Is God alone all by himself? We worship you. Lord, I will praise you without a reason. I will still praise you if you give me a miracle. Yes, I will praise you without a reason. Yes, Lord. For you are God alone, you are God. When in majesty, Lord, you wait. King of authority, authority, you are God. You are God. You are God alone. You are God. Thank you, Jesus. You reign in majesty. Lord, you reign. King of authority. Authority. You are God. You are God. Alone. Yes, he's God alone. Father, we worship you tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are God alone in my life. Thank you for this disappointment, for everything. You remain God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Unchangeable, unstoppable. You are God. Is the unchangeable God. We worship you, Lord. You are God in this probable, immovable, incomparable God. You are God. You can't compare him to anything. Come on. Father, we worship you. Father, we worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Immovable. This is a song done by Tolu Ojukoya Ijogo. God alone. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. You are God alone. You are God. You reign in majesty. Lord, you reign. 
king of authority, authority. You are God. You are God. Father, we will turn all the gold glory to you, Lord. Is God alone? Is God alone? Is God alone? There is no one to compare to him. There is no one to compare to you, Lord. Nobody like you, Lord. Yes, nobody like our God. Nobody, nobody, nobody like our God. Tonight, Father, we return all the glory to you, even as we learn at your feet tonight. Spirit divine, we ask that you come and speak to us. Not about our pain anyway. <laughs> I return all the glory to you. I just return all the glory to you. Return all the glory to you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we have worshipped. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay, so what are we going to do tonight? Um, last month in the Beauty Makers Academy Facebook, we started a series and the essence of the series is this reading Isaiah chapter 61 which is the good news for the oppressed our father in heaven is encouraging you and I that we should forget about what we've gone through in the past he's starting afresh with us he's giving us a new name and so we're going through a series to understand the context behind the names he's calling us because if you read for Isaiah 61, the one we treated last month, for instance, says, to all women in Israel, that's reading from verse 3, 61, 3, he said, he will give you a crown of beauty for ashes. So we wanted to understand what's the context behind us being given a crown of beauty for ashes and why is God calling us a crown of beauty for ashes. So we dealt with that last month. So I won't be going too much details on that. But from what we learned last month, we learned that being a crown of beauty, having a crown of beauty, um, means we are precious to God, we are happy of God's eyes, um, we carry a form of royalty. God expects us as beauties to beautify the world for his glory with our talents. He expects us to raise all the beauties for him. And then we use Esther as a case study last month. We learned so many things. I would advise you watch the recording. You'll be blessed by it. So that's a recap. So we're moving forward. Like I said, we are sharing the good news that God has given to us in Isaiah 61, which is the bedrock of this academy, Beauty Makers Academy. So the next one after a crown of beauty for hashes, if you read on to verse 4 of chapter 61, Isaiah 61, 4, it said, they will rebuild the ancient reigns Repairing cities destroyed long ago, they will revive them, though they've been deserted for many generations. So we have talked about crown of beauty. So the one we want to talk about today is the one in verse four. God has is from what we've read here. God has empowered you and I to rebuild ancient reigns, to repair cities that have been destroyed long ago, to revive them, though they've been deserted for many generations. So that's what we want to understand today. What does it mean to be empowered to rebuild? What am I supposed to be doing if God has empowered me to rebuild? What does it mean to be empowered to rebuild? What am I rebuilding? How can I be successful in, being, um, in rebuilding? You know, understand? So that's what we want to talk about tonight. We pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us because I also want to learn. And so as I'm talking, I pray that the Holy Spirit minister to me too in Jesus' name. So what does it mean to rebuild? When you say you're rebuilding something, it simply means you're building something that has been damaged, something that has been destroyed. And there are other synonyms for that. It could mean you want to reconstruct something, you want to renovate something, you want to restore something, you want to remake. So what you're essentially doing is that something that has been bad, you're not coming to make it better. You know, you're putting it back together. And what does it mean to be empowered? It means you've been given a power to do something. You've been given an authority to do something. You've been given a permit. You've been given an enablement to do something. Now, what essentially are we doing in a sense? You know, when we say we're empowered to rebuild, it could be your area of, any area of your life that 
you know, you know that things are not working well. So you want to rebuild. It could be that God is giving you a ministry in other people's life, perhaps ministry to the widows, perhaps ministry to their orphans or people who have been downhearted and is empowering you to help them rebuild their destinies. Perhaps there's a certain project, a certain thing you're trying to rebuild. So it could be in different contexts. So now what is our case study tonight? Our case study is Nehemiah. Okay, so let me just give you a background so that you can understand very well. Now, you see, the people of Judah sinned against God. And so for years, they were taken from Judah and they were held in captivity in Babylon. And during that time, they were in Babylon. Their land was destroyed, their temple, their walls, and their gates were all destroyed. But then in, in um, Estra chapter 1, if you read it from the, the verse 1 then, you realize that it's, this was based on prophecy and it happened. King Cyrus allowed the exiles to return back to Jerusalem. And the whole book of Extra was about the story of how the temple of Jerusalem, which was destroyed, was rebuilt after a great ordeal. So the whole recounts of Extra chapter, um, uh, the book of Extra was about the rebuilding of the temple that was destroyed. But then there were still other things that needed to be rebuilt. So the walls of Jerusalem at that point were still down and the gates of Jerusalem were still down. And you know the importance of the wall. The wall is like a defense. So that was still down. And the book of Extra is before the book of Nehemiah. So at Extra, the temple was rebuilt. So now we want to go to Nehemiah. I just needed to explain. So I will first start by reading Nehemiah chapter 1. I'll read from verses 1 to 10. Nehemiah chapter 1 from verses 1 to 10. Okay. All right. Nehemiah 1. From verses 1 to 10. These are the members of Nehemiah, son of Archelia. In the late autumn, in the month of his leave, in, in the 20th year of King Asherah's reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. And a near one of my brothers came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love, with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, and I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, even then, then even you are exiled to the ends of the earth. I will bring you to the place I've chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. In this recount, what actually happened is that um, Nehemiah, you know, Nehemiah is now in exile, okay? So there were some visits from people um, from Judah. They came to visit um, Nehemiah. So at that point, Nehemiah inquired of them. He said, he asked, what's going on? Ah, things back in, in Jerusalem. And they told him, things are not good. The walls is down. They recounted, you know, the ordeals that was going on in Jerusalem. That the, the walls is down, the gates is down. You know, it has been destroyed by fire. And the Bible says here that Nehemiah wasn't happy. The Bible says he wept. The Bible says he cried and he prayed to God. So that's the context of where we are going to. All right. So now, like I said, what does it mean to have the responsibility to rebuild? And how do we succeed in this responsibility? Now, this thing we're going through today, we can apply to any area of your life. Any area of your life, you know that you're rebuilding something. 
you can definitely apply to it. So what does it mean to have a responsibility to rebuild? What it simply means that you have a responsibility to return something that is destroyed back to its original state, or even a far better state than the original state. That means you have the responsibility to revive something that is dead, something that is buried. So now the question is that, what can we rebuild? Any area of your life, you see that things are not working out the way it's supposed to be, it needs to be rebuilt. Or perhaps God gives you an assignment to rebuild something that is not working well. It could also be in different contexts, like I've said. Now let's take Nehemiah, like we said, as an example. Nehemiah heard about what was going on in Jerusalem. He was sad. The Bible says he cried and he wept. So that means that a certain burden came on him. There were other people that would have probably heard about it and they were not really bothered. Even the people that were in Jerusalem, maybe they were not even bothered. But Nehemiah in his own case, a certain burden came on him. A certain impression came on him. He wasn't happy about the state, you know? So something came on him. So now the question we're asking is that, how do we succeed in this responsibility to rebuild? Since the Bible has said in Isaiah 61 that we first read, that we've been empowered to rebuild ancient reigns. That means you and I, wherever anything is bad that needs rebuilding, God has empowered us to rebuild it. So what can we do? What are we supposed to be doing so that we can, be, we can succeed in such responsibility? I learned a lot of things while reading this chapter. I'm in this book of Nehemiah, and I want to share those things I learned. And I pray that as I share them, the Holy Spirit will interpret it into your own context, into your own situation, so that you understand what to do. Because I believe the word of God is a revelation for us at a time like this. The first thing I realized is that Nehemiah had a sincere concern for the situation. The Bible says he cried and he wept. So whatever God is asking you to rebuild or has told you to rebuild, you have to have a genuine concern for that thing. That's the only way you can succeed in rebuilding that thing. And another thing I noticed there from that is that whatever you have so much burden about, it can be a pointer that God is saying you have a work to do concerning that thing. Two people can be working together, for instance, and they both hear that information. And it doesn't bother us one person, it bothers the second. Perhaps the other, the first person was not given the mandate or it's not God's will for the person to do the rebuilding. But you, that that thing is really getting to you. It's a pointer that God is saying that there's a work for you to do concerning that. So the first thing I realized is that for you to be successful in any rebuilding you are doing, you have to have a sincere concern for that problem. You have to have a sincere concern for that situation. It has to come from your sincerity of mind. Now, the second thing we read in verse five of Nehemiah chapter one is that Nehemiah prayed. After he heard that, the Bible says in verse five, then I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great awesome God. That means Nehemiah cried out to God. And I love the prayer I prayed. His prayer was strategic. The first thing he said was he prayed for forgiveness and mercy for the whole people of Jerusalem. Lord, we have sinned against you. Please forgive us. He prayed for mercy concerning himself. He prayed for mercy concerning his family. So for you to be able to succeed in any rebuilding God is asking you to do, you must first start with prayer. It's important. Are you rebuilding a home? Are you rebuilding your career? Are you rebuilding something? Your God has given you a mission to rebuild something. You must first start with prayer. And the prayer has to be strategic. Pray for forgiveness. Pray for mercy. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, we need to pray for mercy. Prayer for mercy is very important. So he prayed for mercy. Even in his prayer, he also prayed for help, favor, and success. He said, God, please help me. Let me find favor today. Let me find success today. Let me find favor with the king. So he prayed for success. He prayed for help. He prayed for favor. One thing you need to know is that in any rebuilding tax, by strength, you cannot prevail. By strength, I cannot prevail. The Bible says, except the Lord builds a house. Whoever is laboring is just laboring in vain. So the help of God is paramount. 
So the second thing he did was he prayed. We need to pray. It's very, very, very important. Now, the third thing that Nehemiah did was this. He used the position, the relationships around him wisely and effectively. Let me explain what I mean. In Nehemiah chapter 1, still in chapter 1, verse 11, the last um, sentence then, he said, in those days, I was the king's cup bearer. So at the time Nehemiah had this bad news, he was the king's cup bearer. And of course, being close to the king is an opportunity to talk to the king, is an opportunity to you know, show, to, you know, to communicate with the king. So he used that position to the benefits of this rebuilding. You will see what happens now. So he used that position wisely. His relationship to the king, being the king cup's bearer, he used it towards the cost of this rebuilding. He used it wisely and he used it effectively. You will see in chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Let's see what Nehemiah did then. In Nehemiah 2, 1 to 4, he said, Early the following spring, in the month of Nisan, after he heard uh, the bad news, during the 20th year of King Astra's reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, Why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, Long live the king. How can I not be sad? But the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, Well, ah, how can I help you? Well, how can I help you? So he, he used that position wisely. He showed his countenance to the king. And through the king seeing his countenance, the king says, Okay, how can I help you? So it's important that while you are rebuilding, be observant of relationships position you are in. Use it wisely towards that cause. God would have positioned you somewhere. Use it wisely towards the rebuilding. He will place some relationships around you. Use it wisely towards that cause. That is part of the gold in your hand that you should use wisely. The next thing Nehemiah did was, he was wise to take advantage of the opportunity to get help. You see, when the king looked at his countenance and said, okay, Nehemiah, how can I help you? Immediately, Nehemiah heard that. That was a blank ticket. He used the opportunity and he went ahead and asked the king for help. He said, King, I need some time to go and do this rebuilding. I need this. I need that. I need this support. I need that. So it's very important that we take advantage of the opportunity to get help because we certainly will need help to do the rebuilding and some opportunities will come to you. It's very, very important to be, to be, to be, you know, to be able to see those opportunities and be wise to take advantage of it. Now, another thing Nehemiah did, which I loved, in chapter, still in chapter 2, let's read from verses 11 to 16. Because what happened was, after he asked the king for all the things that he wanted, the king now said, go ahead, go and do the rebuilding, and he left. When he got to Jerusalem, see what Nehemiah first did when he got to Jerusalem. It is true that it was told that the walls were down, blah, blah, blah has happened. But he decided to first go and inspect the wall himself. He didn't just go and act on information that he was told. He decided to do an underground work himself. Further work, further research to understand the gravity of the rains of, of the wall. Let's read verse 11 to 16 so you can understand. He said in Nehemiah 2, 11 to 16, it says, so I arrived in Jerusalem. Three days later, I slipped out during the night. Can you see that? Taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. After dark, I went through the valley gates past the jackal's wall and over to the dung gates to inspect the broken walls and bond gates. To inspect the broken walls and the bond gates. Nehemiah was wise to know that, yes, I was told that there has been a damage. Yes, I was told that things have gone bad, but I need to go and understand the gravity myself. I need to be clear on what has happened. I need to know the specific thing I'm coming here to do. I need to be well informed about the rebuilding tax I'm about to embark on. So he did extra private research on his own. He went at night when people will not know. 
So now you are about to rebuild. You want to rebuild a career, you want to rebuild a project, you want to rebuild something. How much on the study have you done concerning that matter? How much late night reading, late night study have you done concerning that matter? Or are you just relying on the information you were given that oh, that place is broken or and you did not go and do your own personal research on that thing? You want to rebuild something. How much of that thing do you know? How much? So it's very important to do more work, to be more clear, to know the specific thing you're about to solve, to do more reading, to do more research, and to be well informed about the task you're about to embark on. So that was another thing Nehemiah did. Now let's continue. Now we read here that he said, the Bible says he went privately at night. There are some things that you must do alone. There are some things that you must do secretly. It's important. You know, there's some things you need to do alone. You need to do some personal research and personal reading to know and to be well informed. It's when you are well informed about something that you can come out and even speak to people. The truth of the matter is you're not well informed about something and you want to sell something to someone. How would they buy into something that you yourself are not even well informed about? So you need to go and do your own personal study and understand the depth of the problem and understand the depth of the project before you can come and speak to us and so we can buy in into it. You understand? So it's very, very important to be well informed about your rebuilding task. Very, very important. So now let's go on. So the Bible says still in chapter two, I'm going to read from verse 17 to 18. Now let's the first start from 16. He said the city officers did not know I'd been out there. Can you see that? Or what I was doing. He didn't tell the city officers at that time. He just first, merely got to Jerusalem. The first thing he went to do was to inspect, to do a personal inspection. So the city officers at that time, they were not knowing he was there or what he was doing. For I had not said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders the priests, the nobles, the officers, or anyone else in the administration. So at that time, he was wise enough to not to share the plans. He knew the burden he came with. The first thing he went to do was to do a personal research, to do a personal inspection, to understand the gravity of what he was about to start, to understand the gravity of the project he was about to embark upon. You understand? At that time, he didn't tell the city officers. He didn't mention anything to anybody. You understand? Then in verse 17, the Bible now said, but now, after he had done the other work, in chapter 2, verse 17, but now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Let me explain something. Nehemiah was the one that God impressed the burden on. But Nehemiah knew that he could not do the rebuilding on his own. He needed people. But before he can get the buy-in from people, before he can get people to support him on the course, he needed to go and do a personal study himself to understand the gravity of what he was about to do. So that when he brings his case before the people, they will buy him. He can't come before these people and now talk as a novice. He can't talk, he come before these people and start talking like someone that does not even know what he's saying. Because if he does that, they won't buy him. So here you are, you want to rebuild something. You want to rebuild a project. You want people to buy in and support you. You want people to buy in and put in their support. But yes, you, you are not eloquent about what you're saying. You're not well learned about what you're saying. You've not done your own personal research. You don't, know, you don't know the extent of the problem you're about to solve. You've not gone in the middle of the night to do your own personal research. How will people buy in? You must do yours first before you share the plans. People will only follow after a leader that they know knows what he's saying. Not a leader does, that does not know what he's saying. So it's very, very important. And to share the plans at the right time. You don't just share the plans at the wrong time. So it was wise to share the plans at the right time. 
So the Bible says, like we've just read, he now shared it to them. Look at how we shared it to them. He told them, ah, my people see, oh, this thing are really, really destroyed. Oh, we need to do something right now. We need to hang the shame more. We need to. So at that time, he was able to get a by him. He was able to enter into them very well because he had done his own personal research. So like I said, he made sure he got the support of the key people. The Bible says the priests, the nobles, the officers, anyone else in administration, he made sure that he got their support. He had gone to do his own personal research. He now came to make sure that the hand times are, he got their support. So for you to rebuild, get it straight. You have maybe the one consumed with the body more than any other person. It's because perhaps God is, God is saying it's your own tax to carry. But then you need people to help you. So you need to make sure you get the support of those key people. So you need to make sure that you get the support So like I said, you need to make sure that you get the support of those key people. It's very important that you get their support. Then last, another thing was that when distractions, you need to also know that while you're rebu rebuilding, distractions and discouragements will come in. But your boast and your confidence should be in Jesus. Because after you got the support of these people, I like what they said here in verse, it's still in chapter 2. When he told them, he said, they replied at once. They said, yes, come on, let's rebuild the wall. Let's, let's rebuild it. So they started the good work. So this, look at how the Bible even qualifies. It is a good work. So when you are rebuilding an ancient reign, just know and be encouraged that you're doing a good work. So keep at it. So they began the good work. But guess what? In verse 19, but when Sambala, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Harab, Head of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? They asked. What did he say in verse 20? I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. Distractions and discouragements will come while you're trying to rebuild. So the question is, your boast and your confidence, where is it? Is it in yourself? or your boast and your confidence is in Jesus. Look at how Nehemiah answered. said, God will help us because our boast and our confidence <clears throat> is in Jesus. So your boast must be in Jesus. Now let's go on. In chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, because while they continue to do this, the enemies kept opposing them. Now I'm trying to compress it. It's a very long story, but I just want to get out the points. So while they were doing all this, the opposition continued. But if you read chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, let's read Nehemiah 4, 1 to 5, so that you can get this. Sambalat was very angry when he learned. Tobiah and Sambalat were the two people that were opposing the rebuilding of this walls of Jerusalem. So Sambalat was very angry when he learned that they were rebuilding the wall. Can you imagine that? He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think that they are doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think that they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and church ones at that? So by the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall could collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. Then I prayed, Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back upon their own heads, and may they, may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. 
What am I trying to say? Why you're rebuilding, you have to continue to pray because instructions will come. You can see here, what they were fighting him. Nehemiah was just doing what? He was praying to God. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 16 to 15, there's something I want us to understand. I won't read everything. But be aware that it gets harder when you are halfway done. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4. I'll just read verse 6. He said, at last the world was completed to half its height around the entire city. For the people had worked with enthusiasm. You see, the people put their, you know, at the work and they were doing the work. But it was getting even more harder. Even when it was half completed, it was harder. Tobias and Sambalat did not stop. They continued. So I want you to know that while you are trying to rebuild, whatever you are trying to rebuild, as it gets into the hand, it gets harder. You know, so you need to be, to, 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 be, to be aware of that and be prepared for that. That's why I said, while you are rebuilding, the prayer has to what? Continue. Now, there was something else Nehemiah did, which is something that is very, very, very important that I really, really need to share. Because a lot of us are not doing that. It is important that while you're rebuilding, you look out for risk. And when you see risk, you address them immediately until they become an issue. My experience in the project management industry, I know that when we see a risk, it means something that's showing you flashing, flashing. It has not fully happened. It's warning you, giving you signals. So at that moment, what you're supposed to do is to put a contingency plan in place or a mitigation strategy so that the risk will not become an issue. It's when you close your eyes against risk, it becomes an issue. And that is not a wise step at all. Now, a lot of Christians go under this syndrome of it is well. Yes, the Bible wants us to profess that it is well. But then when God is showing you some risk, he wants you to take some steps. But most times we don't take the step. We close our eyes to it and then it becomes an issue. They will not start running out of skelter. But in this case, Nehemiah did not close his eyes to risk. As they were rebuilding, he was opening his eyes. And when he spots any risk, he will address the risk so that it will not become an issue. Now, let me share with you some of the risk he spotted. The first risk he spotted was that is in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. Nehemiah 4, 7 to 8. But when Sam, Nehemiah chapter 4, 7 to 8. But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Harabs, the Ammonites and Ashodites, heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious and they all made plans to call. So let me read from verse 7 to 8. But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Hamonites and Ashodites, heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They, are, they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. Can you see that? So that was a risk that Nehemiah saw, that he heard that these people are making plans to come and fight against them. Well, wait a minute, didn't Nehemiah just close his eyes against it? Did Nehemiah just say, mm, it is well? No, Nehemiah addressed that risk. And what did he do? In verse 9, the Bible says, but we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. He did two things. He put two strategies in place. He prayed and he guided the city. So while you are rebuilding, watch out for risk. Risk, they will show you. Risk will be glaring to you. Do something to address it so that the risk will not become an issue and stop the rebuilding. It's when you don't address the risk, it becomes an issue and may stop the rebuilding. Very important. Another risk that you identified with, we'll read that in chapter 4 again, verse 10 to 11. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired 
and there's so much rumble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. That was another risk Nehemiah heard. The people of Judah that were doing the work were getting tired and they were already getting discouraged. The words from their enemies were already threatening them. Did Nehemiah close his ear against this? Did he say to them, don't mind these people, they are just lazy people, let them continue complaining. No, the people that are helping you to do the rebuilding, there's tendency for them to get tired. The people in your team, there's tendency for them to get tired. The truth is that you will have the burden for that thing more than them. It's not because they are bad people, but it's mainly because you are the one that God has placed that burden more on. They are just a support network. So now that they are getting tired physically and emotionally, should you just close your back against them and say they are just a lazy bunch of people? No! If you do that, the risk will become an issue and may stop the rebuilding. What you are supposed to do is to address it. And how did, did Nehemiah address it? He knew the people were scared. They were concerned about their safety. So what did he do? He protected the people. He put, a, he put some protection strategies in place. He knew they were discouraged. What did he do? He called them to a meeting. He spoke to them. He encouraged them. See it in verse 13 to 14. Look at what he did. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Can you see that? He protected the people. Then in verse 14, then as I looked over the situation, can you see that? That's a wise man. He looked over the risk. I looked over their complaints. I didn't ignore their complaints. I called together the nobles, the nobles, and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. He encouraged them. Don't be afraid of them. How much are you encouraging your support network that are helping you in the rebuilding? Or are you criticizing them, saying that they are just a bunch of lazy people? It is important for the rebuilding to be successful. Identify risk and address it. So that was what he did. So let's continue. Another thing I noticed is in verse 21 of still same chapter 4. He says, we walked early and late from sunrise to sunset. Can you see that? Hard work is necessary to rebuild. It's not easy. I'll give you an instance. This recording that I'm doing, this is not the first time I'm doing this particular recording. I did the first recording. Now, fortunately, I did not press record. Can you imagine? After doing everything and saying everything, it can be so devastating. But I said, no, this word must come out. I had to start all over again in the middle of the night. Good things, doing God's work, rebuilding does not come that easy. You just need to put more effort into it. It requires hard work. Hard work is necessary. Nehemiah chapter 4, when we said they both, the Bible says they worked early and late from sunrise to sunset. How much of work are you putting into the rebuilding project you need to work at? Then in verse 23, during this time, still in chapter 4, said during this time, none of us, not I, nor our relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. Can you imagine? We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Do you know what that means? They were on guard at all times because they knew that the enemies were around to stop the project from going on. So they were on guard. They didn't, they didn't leave themselves loose. The Bible says that the devil has a roaring lion and seeking womb to devour. You are trying to rebuild an ancient reigns and you expect the devil to just be looking at you and not come and back at you. You are missing it. When you decide to embark on anything, to restore something that has been destroyed, even in your life, in the life of other people's or any project, just know that the enemy hates you with great passion. So you just have to be on guard. It's very, very important. Now in Nehemiah chapter 5, something else that Nehemiah did, which I love so much, 
I won't be able to read the whole verse of chapter 5, but I'll just tell you what happened. At some point, it got to Nehemiah's knowledge that even within the people of Judah themselves, some people were being cheated. Those who were rich among them were borrowing those who needed money, money, okay? And they were collecting interest. Imagine within the same circles of family room, they were collecting interest, not only collecting interest, they were even telling them, they were giving them money in a stage of slavery, telling them to sell their family members or things like that. When in my head, he said, what kind of a thing is this? Even within ourselves, see what we are doing to ourselves. You understand? So it's important that as you're rebuilding, in anything you're doing, let the fear of God be paramount. Nehemiah had to readdress this. He said, no, no, no. He, he was able to show the love for the people. He was able to show in every decision he was making that he feared God. So the fear of God and the love for the people is also important. Now in Nehemiah chapter 6, now when Tobiah and Sabala did everything they could do, they tried everything to discourage it, it just did not work. Another tactic was that they now sent somebody to Nehemiah to go and call him. Now, Nehemiah, come, come, it's urgent, you have to come and see us, we need to talk. But well, thank God that Nehemiah had the discerning within him, that this call is a trap. This call is, is an harm. They want to harm me, they want to do something. So while you were rebuilding, it's important to be discerning. It's important to have wisdom, to know things that you should say no to and things that you should say yes to. It's not every juicy offers that you should accept. It's not every juicy friendship that you should say yes to. Some friendship and some invitations are coming to stop you from the work. Some friendship and invitations are coming to spy you and put you into danger. So you need to be discerning and to know. That is also very, very important. Then in verse 9 of the same chapter 6, Nehemiah 6, 9, let me read that. Nehemiah, this was Nehemiah talking. He said, they were just trying to intimidate us. Imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continue the work even with greater determination. To complete successfully any rebuilding project, it requires great determination. It requires great determination. And lastly, know that the rebuilding can only be completed with God's help. What we have learned this evening can be applied to any rebuilding project you may be embarking upon. As we have learned in Isaiah, that God has empowered you and I to rebuild ancient reigns. He didn't just make us a beauty for nothing. He wants us to go raise beauties for him, make the world a better place, impact our community, our society, rebuild ancient reigns in our life, in our family, lives of people around us. He may have even given us a specific project to do, specific thing to do. What you need to do are these things I've mentioned. So I'll just give a quick recap. For you to succeed in that rebuilding project, you have to have a sincere concern for that situation. It has to be genuine. Number two, you need to pray to God first. You need to ask for his mercy. You need to ask for his forgiveness. You need to pray for his help. You need to pray for favor. Favor with people that we, you need. Like Nehemiah needed the king to give him permission. He needed the king to give him some resources. You need favor. Because by strength you can't prevail. Number three, you need to make sure that the relationships around you, the position you are occupying, you're using it wisely and effectively towards that cause and not against the cause. You, towards the cause of the rebuilding and not against it. Just like Nehemiah, it was the king called bearer and he used it to get him help to go and do it. You need to be wise to take advantage of opportunities. When people offer you opportunities to help you, be wise and take advantage. The king said, how can I help you? And Nehemiah, with prayer in his heart, tabled it before the king. So you need to be wise to take advantage of those opportunities. People will come to want to help. You, five, you need to be well informed about what you are even about to embark on. 
How can you rebuild something you don't even know about yourself? People won't even support you because you yourself, they don't even know if you know what you are doing. You are doing this, you are doing that. You need to be well informed about the rebuilding tax. You need to be clear. You need to have a specific thing. Nehemiah was specific. He knew the two things he was going to Jerusalem to do was to rebuild the wall, was to rebuild the gates. He was not going to do general rebuilding. You know, you need to be specific. He was certain. He was well informed. He went there. The Bible says he went to inspect. You need to inspect what you are doing. You need to do late night inspection. You understand? When nobody is there, you need to do your own private work to understand. And then you need to be wise to know when to share the plans. You need to ensure that you yourself, you are well informed of what you are about to do before you now start sharing it to people who will be your support network so that you can get their buy-in. When they know that you understand the problem, they will say, yes, we will join you to do the work because they know that you yourself, you have gone to do your own homework. Not that you don't know your own homework and then you want them, you want to get a buy-in from them. So it's important to get the support of the key people. It's important to know that while you are rebuilding, distractions and discouragement will come. But when it comes, is your boast in yourself, in your title, or your boast and confidence is in Jesus? Please, it's important. It's important to know that while you are rebuilding, prayer must not cease. It must continue. It must continue. You must also know that it even gets harder when you are almost done with it. That's when it gets harder. But you must be, you know, you must press on. And while you are rebuilding, it's important to look out for risk. Don't close your eyes. Risks are there as pointers for you to address on time so that it will not become an issue. Because when it becomes an issue, the rebuilding may stop. It may stop. But when you address the risk that you are seeing, it will help save matters. Hard work is necessary. And it's also necessary to be on guard at all times. Fear of God while you are making decisions is paramount. And the love for the people. Wisdom to discern what to say yes to, invitation to say yes to, or else you may end up falling into the trap of those who don't want you to continue with the rebuilding. And you have to be determined to continue. Despite the, 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 the distractions, you have to be determined. And know this, that the rebuilding can be completed with the help of God. I believe so strongly in my spirit that God has spoken to you. Maybe there's a project you're embarking on, or God has given you a mandate or an instruction to do something. And you know that this thing has long time been destroyed, and you're wondering, how can you do it? This book of Nehemiah is a great exposition. I've shared what I've learned. You can also go and sit down with the book, and the Holy Spirit will share more to you. But I tell you, these steps that I've mentioned are very important. And if we do them, we will see the result just like Nehemiah saw them. So I just want to return God all the glory to God for what he has done. And I want us to pray. You know, like I said, it's the Holy Spirit that can help us to do the work of God. We cannot do it ourselves. It's just not possible. So I want us to pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to do his work. The Holy Spirit will help us to do his work. Let's begin to pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will help us to do your work in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us to do your work in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, empower us to do your work in the name of Jesus. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps there's anyone who is discouraged at this moment. We pray that Holy Spirit, you will encourage all everyone in the name of Jesus. As many as those has been given one task or the other to do, 
we pray for strength. Pray for yourself that every tax that God has given to you, that God will empower you to finish it. The Bible says the same hand that I've started this work, we complete it. Let's pray that every project that God has empowered you to rebuild the grace to complete it, begin to ask from God right now, begin to ask from the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you. We turn all the glory to you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because by your grace, we are able to accomplish that which you have ordained for us to do. And by your wisdom, we'll forge ahead in the name of Jesus. The same hands that have started this, we complete it in the name of Jesus. We empower to rebuild ancient reigns. We empower to rebuild destinies. Holy Spirit will help us. We will not fall, we will not fail in Jesus' name. Thank you, Spirit of the living God. Blessed be to your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for listening. I believe this has been a blessing to you. Can you kindly share this video if it has been a blessing to you? Perhaps you want to be a member of Beauty Makers Academy Facebook group. Do please comment on this video um, and let me know so I can add you to the group. God bless you. My name is Temito Poyewole and thank you for listening. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.